And that being said, uh, this week we're starting a brand new series uh, that was partially inspired by something I did uh, about a month ago. And it's kind of fallen out of style, and I found this out for sure during Sabbath school when I asked. But uh, about a month ago, I made a series of New Year's resolutions, or just goals of things that I want to accomplish in this upcoming year. And I found out in Sabbath school uh, that nobody does that anymore, that nobody really does. I don't know how many of you guys do this, but I know that for a while, this was really, really big, where like the new year comes, new year, new me, new goals, these things I want to accomplish. And so in that spirit, I made these goals. But what I do is last year, I made these, uh, made these goals and I put them on a notes app. And then I locked it, and every once in a while, I'll check up on them. And so at the end of last year, the last week of December, I would open up that app. I would open up that notes page and see, okay, what are the goals that I made at the beginning of last year, and how many of them had I accomplished? And then based off that, it'll determine the new goals that I make for this year. And I realized as I opened up um, my notes app from last year, and again, I haven't touched this. I've looked at it, but I haven't touched it since pretty much the first week of 2023. I realized that I had accomplished None of these goals. And it hit me that I was like, oh my goodness, all of these are my goals for this year. Actually, every single one of the goals I made last year, I was like, actually, that can all just carry over. And it was a very, it was like funny, ridiculous. And then I was like, that's actually really, really sad. That was a very sobering moment. I was like, oh my goodness, what, what did I do this past year? And it hit me that while it's not true that I didn't accomplish anything last year, that's not true at all. A lot of things happened. A lot, a lot of really big things happened towards the end of last year for me. But it's, it, it felt weird to feel like, I, in a sense, I felt like I didn't really grow as much as I felt like I should have, or at least relative to how much I felt I should have grown at the beginning of last year. And it was kind of a terrible feeling that I had. And because of that, that feeling kind of led to a much deeper line of thought and sort of rabbit hole in my shower thoughts. And for the last few weeks, I've been kind of simmering on this, and that's kind of been the birth of, of this series. And this series is called Growing Up. It's a series on sanctification. You may or may not be able to tell, but uh, I came up with this by myself. This, if you are a first time at church, you don't really know how things work. Pastor Chris, aside from being our lead pastor, is also kind of the artistic director of our church. Everything from our sermon graphics to all the small little titles he makes. Um, I decided to surprise him, actually. I was like, you know what? Pastor Chris wanted me to preach this week, and you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll make it a series. And you know what? Instead of asking him, you may not know this, but he makes all of our series, like graphics, from scratch. He'll start with nothing, and then he'll want Adobe Illustrator and do all the magical stuff that he does. I went straight to Canva, and I looked at the free templates that I could use, but I was like, what would Pastor Chris put into the Canva keyword search? So I put minimal, and then this is the one I chose, and I, I showed him yesterday, and he was a little bit shocked, but to ease his shock, I showed him four other ones that were much worse than this, and they ended with, and he was still like, are you sure? But, you know, being the gracious leader that he is, he said, all right, if this is what you want, you can go with it. So... It's a series, uh, and you can read this, uh, the subtitles. It's a series on sanctification. The title is Growing Up. Now, even if you grew up in the church, it's possible that you have never really heard the word sanctification before. It's a kind of big, fancy theological word. And sanctification, for the purposes of this series, we'll define it as the process of becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification, in short, kind of at its basic form, is the process of becoming more like Jesus, being free from sin and growing in holiness. Relatively straightforward, if you go to academy or you have a Bible class, feel free to slip this in your Bible essays, get a few extra credit points. Sanctification is a big fancy word that kind of has a very basic meaning, the process of becoming, growing in holiness and becoming more like Jesus. Now, when you talk about sanctification, a lot of times it's used with another word that sounds sort of similar, justification. And again, if you grew up in church, it's still possible you may have heard this word, but no one ever really defined it for you. It was always used in a sentence where it was like, I, that still really doesn't tell me what, it, what that means. And the, for the purposes of this series, justification refers to being saved by Jesus. Being saved by Jesus refers to being free from sin and being saved by Jesus. And we believe, and this is very important, that the only way you can be saved or justified is through faith in what Jesus did for you, hence being saved by Jesus. And that's where we get the term justification by faith. You may or may not have heard this. If you didn't, I don't blame you. I didn't hear that until I got to college and I was studying theology. But justification by faith refers to the belief that we have, that the only thing, the only way that we can be saved from sin, from the consequences of sin, is to believe in what Jesus Christ did for us. The fancy term is 
justification by faith. And if you've ever read through the book of Romans, like small plug for our young adult small groups we're doing right now, Romans chapter 3 um, kind of talks about this. And the idea of justification by faith and salvation is actually a very big theme of Paul's writings in Romans chapter 3. Here's what it says. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. In other words, and you'll, hear, you'll hear me say this a few times during this sermon in this series, there is nothing we can do, we cannot, there's no amount of good that we can be to earn our salvation. The only thing that can save us, again, is belief and faith in what Jesus did on our behalf. That's great, but then the question comes back to, once we find justification and sanctification, the series is not, a, the title of the series is not growing up a series on justification and sanctification, we're really focusing strictly on sanctification. And so, what does, why would I have to define the term justification in order to come to these terms? The reason these two concepts, sanctification and justification, often go hand in hand, they're usually debated or discussed together, is because one is supposed to lead to the other. Here's Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 Uh, Verse 22, but now you are free from the power of sin, have become slaves of God. Now you do the, now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. In other words, when we are justified or saved from sin, because of our faith in Jesus, we must begin the process of sanctification or becoming more like Jesus. Or as Tim Keller put it in an interview, you are saved through faith alone, but not by faith which remains alone. In a lot of ways, this basic premise, if you've never heard this before, this is very important. This is essentially Christianity 101. This lays at the foundation of our relationship with Jesus, Jesus' relationship with us. The relationship between believing in Jesus and becoming more like Jesus is kind of a foundational relationship um, in our relationship with Jesus. That when you believe in Jesus, you must also start the process of becoming more like Jesus and growing in holiness. And understanding that relationship is where this series takes place. But before we go any further, join me in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again um, for the fact that we can join uh, in person together, Father, and worship you and praise you on this Sabbath day, Lord. We thank you that for your graces and your mercies for keeping us safe during this time, Father. Lord, I ask that in this time that you speak through me, Father, and that anything that, the, that is of me can decrease and disappear, and that anything that is of you can increase. Father, I, I, I know and firmly believe that this message is one that was given to me and not of me, Father. So I ask that whoever needs to hear this message, Lord, can have their hearts softened and their ears opened, that they can hear your word today at this time, Father. Humble us, and may you be open to the moving of your spirit. Praise in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. So with all that being said, between this relationship of justification, all these long words, TIO, and all these things that are happening, if you are someone in this room and you proclaim to be a believer of Jesus, a Christian, someone that's been baptized, you're saved by faith, that means that you must also be taking part in the process of sanctification. Anyone that's been baptized knows this. Uh, not that, maybe about a year ago now, we've, we had a baptism not too long ago where a bunch of girls and a lot of people got baptized. And anyone here, if it's been a minute since you've been baptized, you know for sure, better than most, that there is nothing in that water. There's no baking soda, there's no vinegar, there's no hydrogen, there's nothing in there that could possibly change you or clean your sins from any standpoint. It's strictly, really, just a symbolic procedure. And a lot of us, I think, when we get baptized, we know that, but we kind of hope. Like, I think when I come out of the water, when the pastor pulls me out, it'll be like, wow, I feel so good. But the reality is, honestly, from a literal standpoint, when you come out of the water of baptism, you're honestly a little dirtier, to be honest. Like, that, there's no Brita filter back there. That is just tap water. And if you're lucky, then maybe we warm it. But really, at its core, baptism is, is purely, purely symbolic, even though I think a lot of us that have been baptized kind of walk in thinking, okay, that's what they, I know, we took classes, baptismal classes, but I think when I come out of here, Jesus will change me. But anyone that's been baptized knows that's not true at all. That once you are baptized, once you proclaim publicly that I believe in Jesus, that Jesus died for my sins and I'm saved, now a new journey begins. And that is the process of growing in your relationship with Jesus. Not just your closeness with Jesus, but that you would be transformed to become more like Jesus. And simply put, that is the point of this series. 
that being a follower of Jesus requires growth. That sanctification describes the process of growth, of growing in your character, growing in your understanding, growing in your holiness, of becoming more like Jesus. And to bring it back to the idea of, of New Year's resolutions and any goals that you may have set at the beginning of the year, here's a question. If you were to compare yourself, not physically, not mentally, but spiritually, if you were somehow to gauge your relationship with Jesus um, and how similar you are to Jesus, how different would you say you are now versus a year ago? And I know for some of you, you may think, that's, you know, that's harder, that's a harder question to ask, but I asked it in the youth Sabbath school, just humor me for a second. If you could somehow, and I know it's a little bit more vague, it's easier to measure certain metrics, but if you were to ask yourself, am I closer to Jesus? Am I more like Jesus now than it was a year ago? How would you answer that question? Just take a second. Really, this is not a hypothetical. Just in your mind, if you had to, mm, yes, on a scale of one to 10, again, this may be a weird thing to do and there's a lot of different nuances here, but as a broad question, the reason I ask that question is, If we're being honest, the reality is we're intentional about checking all other aspects of growth throughout a year. I think in any given year, most of us check how we've grown in our finances, um, how we've grown in our grades, our our education, any physical goals that we've set, any emotional goals that we've set in our lives. I think for every aspect in our life that's important to us, we plan for and track our growth. For instance, if you were a student and you were in pre-calculus last year, and you're hoping to be in AP Calc this year, but you get your schedule on the first day of class and it says you're in pre-algebra, you'd be like, whoa, 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 wait a second, that's not right. I need to find a counselor, uh, a teacher, a principal, someone to fix this because I should not be going backwards in my education. If I took pre-calc last year, I should be in AP Calc this year, right? If you plan at the beginning of the year, for whatever reason, I want to lose weight, and so for this whole year, I'm gonna eat in a caloric deficit, I'm gonna track my calories, and at the end of the year, you gained weight, You'd be like, whoa, 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 that's not right. That's not good. Let's figure out what's wrong with this, right? If you got a raise last year and the stock market was up last year, but your net worth went down, you'd be like, whoa, 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 wait a second. That's not right. Let's check the metrics. Something is off. The reality is in all important aspects of our life, we plan for and we expect growth. And the question this series, at least part one, is posing to you is, Is your walk with Jesus important enough for you that it warrants growth? I think for a number of us, this is the question we never really asked ourselves outside of maybe baptismal classes and a camp meeting or two. But biblically speaking, the process of sanctification, the idea of growing in Jesus, in many ways is a symptom of justification. In other words, the change that occurs after you believe in Jesus determines whether or not you truly believe in Jesus. There's an asterisk there, and we'll get to that. But in a lot of ways, as kind of a broad statement, there's a lot of truth in this, that you are saved by faith, not by how sanctified you are, but if you're not getting sanctified, then you may not have saving faith. Now, there was an asterisk on there, and the disclaimer is this. I want to acknowledge, because I've experienced it myself, and I just anyone that's lived life knows this to be true, change takes time. And for important things, any meaningful change, um, it rarely, if ever, occurs at a steady progression. Anyone that's tried to pick up a new sport, a new instrument, a new hobby, a new skill, a new language knows this. Very rarely is I put in this amount of time and I get this amount of effort, especially when it comes to something like character change or growth or development. I want to acknowledge that that is true. Right? There are days, I know there's a lot of uh, people in our church and families that are very into volleyball, and I'm sure there are times when you practice and for two weeks you put in the time and effort on all your techniques and you feel like you got worse. And then you stay that way for a while and, and the reality is growth is not necessarily always up and to the right. So I don't want to shame anyone into thinking that you need to be changing and growing at a certain rate and becoming sanctified at a certain number of like, Bible texts per hour to qualify as being a true Christian. That is not true. I believe that. I know that for myself. And I think that's part of the reason why Jesus loved using like gardening illustrations, the illustration of plants and growing and farmers and crops, because in a lot of ways, it takes a plant a really long time to fully grow. And at the beginning, when you first plant a seed, most of the progress takes place out of sight. And all you have to do is make sure that's in a good environment, water it, 
I don't know, I've never raised a plant before, but like water it, sunlight, something, something, unless you're growing a bean in a plastic cup, you can't see anything, right? And again, you just work and you put in the progress and one day you get to see a sprout, but for that sprout to grow fully, who knows how long it takes? I don't, but I'm sure it takes a very, very, very long time. And I think that's part of the why Jesus loved using these kinds of analogies because it described the process of growth and why it's so important for us to understand that being a Christian means necessarily that we are agreeing and putting in the effort and intentionality to grow in our relationship to Christ. And in that same way as Christians, we must be intentional in our own growth and transformation to grow into the character of Christ. That being said, it's a lot easier said than done to just, okay, I guess I'll just become more like Jesus. It's a good thing to say it sounds great, but when you really get down to it, it's, it's pretty difficult. And I think part of the reason it's so difficult It's not, uh, part of the reason it's so difficult and part of the reason it's not a very pleasant thought or experience is partially because change in general is a pretty difficult thing. Anyone that's gone through a move, a different job, a new school, a new environment, new teachers, new job, new instrument, whatever it is, any level of change, even at a fundamental, like outside level, it's very difficult. But it's especially difficult when the thing that needs to be changed is you that when you yourself need to be changed, it's much, much difficult, especially if you don't feel like you need to change. Actually, it's pretty offensive to imply that somebody needs to change, especially in today's culture, right? The reality is secularism and culture at large says, you are amazing just the way you are. And it pains me to use that because I actually really like that song. But the reality is that's kind of the message of the world is you are amazing and perfect just the way you are. You don't need to change. You need to change their minds about you. You are a perfect, completed, flawless model, right? And a lot of the movies and the songs that we sing, uh, songs that we listen to, kind of have that common trope in secular culture that you, everyone tells you to do one thing at changing a form. No, no, no. You are fine. You are perfect. You are great. Actually, they're the people that have the problem, so you need to change their minds. And I don't want to say any particular names in general because a lot of these movies I actually really enjoy watching. But there's a lot of these, these this, this, this theme and this idea is very prevalent in society today because it's actually very offensive today to tell someone, hey, you, you yourself, who you are, you need to change. But the point I'm trying to make, and I think that one, of, one that most of us would agree with, is that to imply that someone needs to change who they are to become like somebody else is really kind of a highly offensive thing to say outside of the context of maybe this sermon. But even in the sermon, there are probably some people in here that are maybe a little bit offended by what I just said now, that sanctification implies that you need to change and to grow in your character. It's much nicer to say that someone is amazing and perfect just the way they are and that we should all just be ourselves. But the problem with that, however, despite how nice it sounds and feels, is that to imply that we don't need to change, to imply that we are perfect and flawless just the way we are, makes a very dangerous implication. Because if we truly don't need to change, if we truly are perfect as we are, there's nothing that needs to be fixed, nothing about us that's broken, then why would we need God? Would that not make us God ourselves? To claim that we don't need to change is to imply that we are perfect, and if we are perfect, then why do we need to have faith that Jesus died for us? To be a Christian, really, I think, is to admit that we are imperfect, and that because we are imperfect and flawed, we need to be saved by someone who is perfect and who is flawless. And I don't think there's a better example of someone in Scripture who met Jesus and had his entire life turned around than Saul of Tarsus. Most of you know him as Saul-Paul. And when we're first introduced to this person, it's in, towards the beginning of the book of Acts. And we first kind of see him as uh, at the, he's present at the first martyr in Christian history. So Stephen is there, and he's tried kind of falsely, and he's killed by the Jewish authorities. And we first see Paul there as kind of a place of honor. Witnessing this all happen, he's holding on to the cloaks, of these people. In one chapter after the murder of the first Christian, um, we see in Acts chapter 8, Paul makes it his personal mission to destroy the church, right? I see this as like a cancer here. We need to get rid of this church, this Jesus movement. It was known as the way back then. And he makes it his personal mission, and he gets the rabbis and the leaders to sign off on it to destroy the Christian church. And in Acts chapter 9, the next chapter, he's on his way to a city called Damascus. 
And on his way to Damascus to do what he normally does, kind of a standard church breakup, he sees this light, and this is what he witnesses in Acts chapter 9. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now, as far as conversion stories goes, this is about as dramatic as it gets. He's on his way to, to, to break up a church, something he's done, and he sees this light. He really has this come to Jesus, or Jesus comes to him moment. And Jesus shows him and tells him, you are hurting me right now. Stop it. And if you know the story, he's blind for a little bit. He goes in the city and he meets someone that heals him. And after this point in his life, Paul's entire life story gets flipped upside down. And he goes from the biggest destroyer and, and inhibitor of the church to the biggest growing factor, someone that spreads the gospel to so many different places. But this is important to note. When you look at Paul and Saul's life and what changed, it's important to know where Saul started from. Saul wasn't really an unbeliever per se. He believed in God, and he was actually a very zealous believer. He just didn't believe that Jesus was God and believed that the Christian movement or the way was hurting God. And so his persecution of the followers of Jesus was his way of standing up for God, of this is my way of trying to do the right thing. This is my way of trying to help God. And because he was doing these things with the intention of being a good person and doing the right thing, this interaction that he has with God shakes him all the more. Because he wasn't, well, there are some flaws that he had and there was some pride that maybe got mixed in. But at its core, he wasn't trying to hurt God. He wasn't trying to be a bad person. In his mind, him breaking up the churches, that was the right thing to do. That was what a good follower of God would do. So with that in mind, this is Ellen White's commentary on what Paul or Saul went through. Saul now saw that in persecuting the followers of Jesus, he had in reality been doing the work of Satan. He saw that his convictions of right and of his own duty had been largely based on his implicit confidence in the priests and rulers. Now that Jesus himself stood revealed, Saul was convinced of the truthfulness of the claims made by his disciples. In other words, Saul's entire transformation process, the thing that triggers it, again, maybe there are a few other interpretations of this, but his transformation begins with the realization that he was wrong, that what he was doing was not right. What he thought was right, what he thought was true, was actually false. And instead of helping God or bolstering God's beliefs or cutting out bad things in the Jesus movement, what he was actually doing was hurting God, something he never really intended to do. And so the moment that turns Paul's life around, Saul's life around so much that it changes his name, is that he realizes that I am wrong. God tells him, what you are doing is not right. And in acknowledging his wrongness, he begins the process of transformation. Now to those of us, before we go any further, I want to add a, a small disclaimer. And, and the reality is, um, throughout the process of preparing this message, I knew I had to put this disclaimer in because it's very important. Um, because if you're someone that's watching either online or in person and you're here and, and you're struggling a lot with self-esteem or self-value or self-worth, it can sound like a lot of what I'm saying is you need to, and you already struggle with loving yourself or finding a sense of self-worth or a sense of worthiness. It can sound like a lot of what I'm saying is, is it can cause you to spiral even deeper down that hole. And if you misinterpret what I'm saying, it's possible that you walk away from this message today feeling like, I went to church and the pastor told me that I'm not a good person. And I already struggle with self-esteem and value, and, and, and it really broke me further. If that's you, I'm glad you're here. And this message still has relevance for you because, because if you're someone that struggles with self-esteem, self-worth, I can see how you can hear this message, and it feels like I'm telling you to think less of yourself. But that's not true at all. Here's why. I would argue that in today's world, your value and your sense of worth comes from and is measured by how good you are, what you can bring to the table, what you can offer, what skills are you good at, what can you bring to my, how can you enrich me, how good of a person are you? 
You've ex- most of us have experienced before at, at home, at school, at work. You're complimented when you succeed. You're complimented when you accomplish things. You're praised when you do good things. You're insulted and canceled uh, when you act out of line or have a moral falling. But the reality is, that's just human nature. And if you're sitting here and you feel like, I have, I have not accomplished much, and you sit here feeling, I don't feel like I'm that worthy or that loved or that valued of a person because... I don't know, what reason do I have to be? I look at my life, I look at the things that I've done or what I'm doing, and and I just, I struggle to see how I'm a valuable person or how I'm someone that's worthy, that I have any sort of worth. And when I look around at how humanity and how the world values people and things, I can see how I I feel like I don't have much value. And maybe that's why you struggle with self-esteem or self-esteem. But the reality is, human nature is one that, of course, we're going to, bolster and compliment things that we like and people that bring value to us. But Jesus' nature is the opposite of that. Jesus measured our value. Jesus measures your value and your worth in your most flawed state. In other words, Jesus, the person who knows how flawed you are more than anybody else, also loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, again, the same person that experiences conversion says that God showed his love for us in sending Jesus to die on our behalf while we were still sinners. That means before you acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, before you decided to embark on this transformation journey, before you said anything good, before you even loved Jesus, God saw you and said, even at your worst, with an acknowledgement of all of your flaws and all of your imperfections, I value you at the life of my son. That's how Jesus measured your worth. That before you had done anything, our life was valued at the highest possible price. And the lie that Satan tells you in your own heart and that we often believe is that our worth actually should be measured by how good we are. How well behaved was I at home? How good are my grades? How great is my production at work? That's my level of worth. That's the lie that Satan wants us to believe. But the truth that Jesus proclaims is before you did any of that stuff, I paid the highest possible price for your soul. That's where your worth should be found. And that because we are imperfect and flawed, that we are undeserving of love, we still receive this amazing grace. And to quote a passage that Paul would later on to remind, he writes this to remind his mentee, Timothy, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and in unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Jesus Christ. That for Paul, his true motive for his transformation was an understanding that, yes, I am wrong. I was hurting God. I am not perfect. But he has loved me and given me grace beyond my wildest imaginations. And that knowledge of accepting both that I am not perfect that I am flawed, I need to grow, I need to change, yet despite my insecurities and my, inf- and my flaws and my imperfections, no one has loved me more than God does in this very moment. Acknowledging and realizing those two things are what triggered the transformation for Paul. And really, that should be the same motive for us, that the person who knows you more than anyone else, that knows more than anyone else how flawed you are, also loves you more than you could imagine, and that your heavenly Father longs for us to grow closer to him and loves us too much to leave us where he found us. And that's really the beginning of the process of sanctification and understanding that I am not perfect. And because I'm not perfect, I needed help from someone that was perfect. But this being that is perfect loves me so much despite the fact that I am imperfect. And because of his love and grace for me, I want to become more like him. If that's your prayer and that's your hope, and maybe at some point in this message you realize, you know, I, it's been a while since I've reminded myself of that. It's been a while. I've been really comfortable the last few months, years, decades, just being the same old, same old. And honestly, I don't feel like I need change. 
I hope you come back for the rest of the series as we explore the process and motive behind how we can grow in our understanding for Christ. Not because we are perfect the way we are, but because despite our imperfections, God loves us wholly, fully, and completely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for this reminder and this mind-boggling grace that you impart to us, Father. Lord, it's It can be easier and simpler for us to feel like that we are perfect and we are flawless, God. But the reality is you show it to us in the gospel that we are flawed and that we are sinful and we are imperfect, God. Lord, it's it's mind-boggling to to realize that despite who we are, despite knowing who we are, you love us to a degree that we could never even imagine. And for that grace, that undeserved mercy and grace that we thank you for who you are. We thank you you've given us that love. Father, I pray that during this week and as we move forward, Lord, you remind us of that love, and that love can be used as a motive and as a trigger to start our own transformation, to continue on our own journey of becoming like the one who loved us first. We thank you again for all that you've done and for your grace. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.